In this class, we will explore the greatly underappreciated topic of exercise psychology. Most people consider exercise to be a purely physical act, such as running, walking, swimming, or bicycling. However, it turns out that the psychology behind exercise is actually much more important to our exercise results than the type of exercise that we might perform. As we will see today, understanding the psychology side of exercise opens up some new and useful insights into why most people struggle to exercise consistently, despite all of their exercise knowledge and resources. These same exercise psychology insights will also help us to identify specific strategies for approaching exercise in a new way that allows us to both reap the many health benefits of regular exercise, while at the same time increasing our enjoyment of exercise. From this slide, you can see that we are now up to topic six in our psychology of eating series, leading us to discuss food psychology, plateau psychology, and food environment psychology after today. You probably already know about many of the health benefits of exercise. Exercise is good for you all the way from your brain, associated with better cognitive abilities and lower dementia risk, for example, all the way down to the bones and muscles in your feet, your feet that become markedly stronger and more resistant to injury from exercise. Exercise helps the inside of your body, such as healthier functioning of organs such as your heart and lungs, just as much as the outside of your body, such as the appearance of muscle tone or a thinner physique. Exercise is so widely beneficial to our bodies and has so few downsides that were we actually able to extract the benefits of exercise and put it into a pill or a medicine, we'd put it straight into the drinking water for everyone to consume on a regular basis. The challenge with exercise is that it, it provides us with benefits only if we do it on a regular basis. How much you exercise as a teenager, for instance, matters very little if you are now 30 or 40 years old and sedentary. The body is a use-it-or-lose-it organism and quickly begins to shed both the structural and the metabolic improvements that result from exercise once you stop. And as you may know, only about 10% to a third of American adults exercise regularly, depending upon how you define regular exercise. These low rates of regular exercise raise a serious question about, well, why do so few Americans exercise regularly? I encourage you to think about that question for a moment because we'll have an answer for it today that might surprise you. It turns out that a lot of survey research has been done to answer the question of why Americans exercise in such low numbers. The results from this research look much like what you see in this slide. For example, the most common reasons that people provide when asked why they don't exercise is that they haven't the time or enough energy to exercise. Now, these are puzzling answers because the same people report that they have the time and energy for hours of television, lots of social media, watching Netflix, shopping, and social activities. It seems like people usually have the time and energy for the things that they enjoy, but not for the things that they don't enjoy. Perhaps this gives you a clue as to why people report exercise barriers that, that don't seem to add up. People also cite barriers such as the cost of gym memberships, limits created by their health problems, and sometimes even because of the poor weather. These certainly can pose difficulties to exercise, but they also don't provide a very good explanation overall. For example, if weather was such a big deal, then surely exercise rates would be much higher among Americans living in better climates, or in summer versus winter seasons. But these differences are small rather than large. Similarly, exercise rates are low even among young and healthy people, just like they are low among older and less healthy people. In conclusion, even though considerable research on exercise barriers among Americans has been done, the conclusions from much of this research don't appear to be accurate. Now, in contrast to the majority of the survey research on exercise, the best explanations in practice for the low rates of exercise in, in the U.S. turn out to be the reason, reasons listed near the bottom of the list of barriers. These are the factors related to emotional aspects of exercise, such as disliking exercise or finding it boring or embarrassing. How people think and feel about exercise is what I call their exercise psychology. Now, let's explore exercise psychology in terms of how it works, as well as how it tends to change for a typical American over their life from, say, childhood to adulthood. 
Young children love to exercise. Developmental research suggests that an affinity for moving and testing our physical limits at a young age is part of our biology. If you are a parent, then you already know from firsthand experience that children require little coaxing to move around and instead often require a lot of intervention to stop them from being more active than what you would like. In terms of our vocabulary today, you could say that children are born with a positive exercise psychology, referring to the positive emotions and positive attitude that they have regarding physical activity. It doesn't take long, however, for this child's inborn positive exercise psychology to become corrupt. By the time children enter school, for instance, they become self-conscious about their bodies. They are compared to other kids and their physical abilities. And what was once playful and exploratory exercise for them has now often become structured into gym classes and sports, and often even into punishment, such as running laps or doing push-ups. This changes the emotional experience for many young people regarding exercise, with exercise now becoming a source of things like anxiety, rejection, teasing, and criticism. If a child isn't lucky enough to be among that 10 or 20 percent of kids gifted at sports, where they then usually receive a lot of praise for exercising, they are probably among the majority who complete their school years with what we could call a negative exercise psychology. And this refers to having mostly negative emotions and a negative attitude about exercise. Unfortunately, instead of being corrected, a negative exercise psychology is usually reinforced in adulthood, where exercise among adults is mostly for unpleasant and negative reasons such as losing weight or being required for jobs such as making weight in the military. For many adults, their once upon a time love for moving their bodies that they had as a child is now turned into shame, guilt, and obligation. It is not unusual at all to hear an adolescent or an adult in America directly say, I hate exercise. Now that we understand the concept of an exercise psychology and how it can profoundly shift based on our life experiences from positive to negative, we can also begin to see how powerful a force this psychology can be in shaping our exercise habits as adults. Working as a weight control professional for the last decade, I've learned that a negative exercise psychology is far more common than a positive exercise psychology among adults, and that a person's exercise psychology, whether it be positive or negative, is often the single most important predictor of whether or not that person will sustain a regular exercise program. The other important benefit of thinking about exercise from the perspective of exercise psychology is that it offers up a practical solution. Namely, that to become a more regular exerciser, a person must improve their exercise psychology. For each of us, this means learning an adult version of our childhood exercise psychology, where we can once again look forward to exercise, enjoy the experience of exercise, and want to make exercise a permanent part of our lifestyle because it makes our life miserably better. In the present, many people feel like it would be impossible for them to enjoy exercise. But when you get that same person, including perhaps yourself, to reflect back and realize that they already had this positive attitude about exercise at some point in their past, then it usually becomes more realistic for them to consider that such a change could be possible. History tells us very clearly that you used to love exercise. If you don't feel this way now, it is because experiences in your life have corrupted the exercise experience for you. But, like a virus on a computer or a pathogen in the body, corruption can usually be identified and often treated to help restore the original state. Restoring you to a state of positive exercise psychology is primarily what we will discuss in the remainder of our time today. Before we launch into positive exercise psychology strategies, here is a slide showing rates of exercise and obesity in the U.S., Canada, and several European countries. The U.S. rates appear on the far left. If you look closely, you can see that we are number one in rates of obesity and dead last in rates of exercise. Now, considering that Americans are at least as well educated about exercise and have more resources related to exercise than the people of any of the countries listed in this graph, how do you think you would have explained our low levels of exercise before our class today? 
listed countries such as Canada, Denmark, and Switzerland, for example, are much darker and colder than most of the U.S., but people in these countries are far thinner on average and much more active. Now that you understand the influence of exercise psychology, it probably won't surprise you to learn that the people in these uh, more active countries have a much more positive attitude about exercise than we do in America. If you have ever heard the expression that some people freeze to death in the winter while other people learn how to ski, then you may now realize that this expression refers partly to the important role of exercise psychology. Now let's shift to discussing specific strategies to helping you rekindle a positive exercise psychology. One fundamental strategy is to improve your reasons for exercising. When Americans do exercise, it is often for reasons that are self-defeating in the long run. For example, most people in America exercise to lose weight or to treat or prevent certain health problems. You might wonder, what is wrong with exercising to lose weight or exercising to prevent or manage diabetes? And the answer is that it is not so much that these reasons are wrong, but that they have unintended side effects. What do you think it does to a person's exercise psychology, for instance, when they exercise to lose weight or to manage health problems? Instead of enjoying exercise, when we exercise for reasons such as weight loss, we tend to think about being fat focus on counting calories. We tend to go for the most extreme and uncomfortable forms of exercise and often just wish that we didn't have to do it at all. Exercising to lose weight, in our language today, sets us up for a negative exercise psychology where we exercise in a way that ruins the experience and causes us to feel bad emotions about exercising. This is perhaps the main reason why people that exercise mostly to lose weight struggle so much to be consistent because of their negative exercise psychology, they have to force themselves to do something that they dislike day after day. And let's be honest, very few people can keep that up for very long. Thankfully, there are better reasons to exercise available for us that we can adopt as replacements. Far better than exercising to lose weight, for example, is to exercise for reasons such as having fun, socializing, exploring, challenging yourself, or developing new skills and having new experiences. When you exercise for these latter kinds of reasons, you find yourself even looking forward to exercising. People, in my experience, who have learned to hate exercise find it hard to understand when they meet somebody who just seems to love working out and eating right. It just it doesn't make any sense from their perspective, and they often just chalk that exercise-loving person up as crazy or weird. But now, I hope that you're beginning to see that there's a better explanation. People who love to exercise feel that way because they have a different attitude about exercise and exercise in a way that gives them positive emotions. If you or I adopted this same attitude and these same kinds of exercise strategies, we could also find ourselves loving to exercise. The second positive exercise psychology strategy that I will share with you involves adopting a healthy analogy for exercise. A healthy analogy can give us a new and helpful way of thinking about exercise and support a different way of approaching exercise in our lives. Although there are many healthy analogies that you might think of, here are four of the ones that I have found to be most helpful in my experience. The first analogy is to think about exercise as an artistic process. An artist doesn't create a masterpiece by blasting their way through a painting or a statue as fast as possible. Instead, a great work of art is usually the result of a slow and deliberate process requiring precise tools and often many corrections along the way. Imagine trying to create a statue from a block of clay in the same way that a person typically tries to lose weight using the equivalent of a sledgehammer or bulldozer as a tool. Is this statue more likely to end up as a great work of art or as a piece of rubble? Another important difference is that an artist also loves what they are creating. This is very different than the typical dieter who often wants to destroy and blast their body fat into submission. An artist analogy can help you to adopt a healthy perspective of loving your body even while you are trying to improve it. The second analogy is to consider exercise as being like the process of harvesting or farming. 
A farmer realizes that their fall harvest is the long-term result of a careful process of planting, weeding, watering, and caring for their crop. They realize that if any of those steps are skipped or hurried, disaster is the probable result. The farmer knows that you can't rush farming and you can't hope to raise crops by attacking the field. If people routinely adopted the harvesting or farming mindset when it came to exercise and weight loss, they would almost certainly have more patience and mostly choose methods that allowed them to achieve better long-term results. The third analogy for exercise is to think of it as an investment process. Smart financial investors do not expect to make a fortune overnight. In fact, they know that anybody promising ways to get rich really fast are in fact probably promising ways to go broke really fast. Financially successful people similarly play the long game, making smart, consistent investments that allow them to make corrections when necessary, and they do not set themselves up to fail by doing things that are too drastic or risky. Investors do their research and make informed decisions about their investment plans. Now consider how different this smart investment process is from the way that a person typically approaches exercise. The latter person often rushing into fast weight loss schemes, buying miracle exercise products that promise six-pack abs in a few minutes a day, and purchasing expensive exercise equipment that too often ends up languishing in their living room or their garage within a few months. In contrast, an investment approach to exercise would be a big improvement for most people. Finally, a fourth analogy for exercise is to consider it as a personal growth process. Successful weight loss is really all about personal growth. A person who manages their weight well isn't just different on the outside of their body. The most important differences are the improvements in the way that they think, manage their emotions, and orient their life. These kinds of changes take time in the same way that you can't get a college degree in a week. You can't earn a black belt on a weekend workshop, and you can't learn a new language overnight. A personal growth perspective puts you into a healthy journey mindset that we discussed, say, way back in Chapter 2. In contrast, rushing towards weight loss leaves you skipping the personal growth changes that you will need to, in fact, keep the weight off once you get there. Similarly, defining your weight loss result exclusively in terms of the amount of weight that you lose will then cause you to overlook the personal growth changes that are really the best indicators of success. Now let's change direction slightly and discuss strategies for improving the fun factor in exercise. Although I will cover 10 to 11 strategies in total here, different strategies work for different people. So don't take these in literal order, but rather be on the lookout for the strategies that you believe can make the biggest difference for you. The first strategy concerns your exercise attitude, and it is often the single best idea to implement to improve your overall exercise experience. This strategy is to make a 180 degree shift in your attitude about exercise so that you stop exercising to lose weight and instead start exercising for fun for socializing and to produce quality of life improvements. You see, it doesn't matter how many calories an exercise burns in theory because unless you find a way to have a good time while doing that exercise, it won't burn any calories for you at all in practice because you won't be doing it. Ask yourself, what kinds of exercise do I most enjoy? Be creative with your answer. This might mean, for instance, traditional forms of exercise such as walking, running, or weightlifting, but it might also mean non-traditional forms of exercise such as dancing, or golf, or bird watching. Similarly, ask yourself, with the type of exercise that I currently do, how could I have more fun doing it? These kinds of questions can produce a huge shift in the quality of the experience that you have while exercising if you apply the answers that you come up with. Secondly, if you are currently an exercise hater, try upgrading your exercise vocabulary. Now I know that this strategy can feel like a Jedi mind trick to some, but it really works for many people, so why not give it a try? A study from several years ago showed that even the act of calling a walk an exercise hike caused people to overindulge on sweets when they finished in comparison to a second group that took the same walk that was for them titled a leisure walk. Terms such as exercise and working out are loaded with negative connotations for some people. 
If this is true for you, start calling your exercise time something that makes you feel good, such as recess, playtime, me time, recreation, or my fountain of youth, whatever works. Find a way to describe exercise that works better for you. This slide is just a visual reinforcement of this exercise vocabulary concept, helping you to make the shift from a more negative workout or exercise mentality to more of a play mentality. Strategy 3 focuses on improving the social component of your exercise. Now, not everyone likes exercising with other people, so if group exercise is not your thing, let this one go and focus on the other strategies. However, for most people, one of the most reliable ways to improve their enjoyment of exercise is to improve the social element. A workout buddy, a workout class, working out with a pet, hiring a trainer, these are just a few of the long list of ways to increase the social experience of exercise. The research is clear that people that share exercise exercise more consistently, work out longer and harder, and get better results. The next strategy is to add an element of challenge to your exercise. There are a few things more destructive to progress than mindless repetition. As human beings, we are biologically wired to pursue growth and improvement. Doing the same thing the same way at the same place will quickly burn out the motivational flame for most people. Instead, on a regular basis, look to step it up a little bit in what you do for exercise. This can be going a little longer, a little harder, or in some other way a little differently than whatever is the norm for you. When you challenge yourself on a regular basis with exercise, you discover something amazing. And that is that you have an incredible capacity to get better as long as you keep trying to get better. This can be a richly rewarding discovery for many people and a strong source of motivation to keep exercising as a means of improving their overall quality of life. Related, but also somewhat different from challenging yourself through exercise, is the strategic use of competition. Research shows very clearly that people get much more out of themselves when in a competitive circumstance. You can run faster, lift more weight, and have greater stamina when in a competitive atmosphere. This means that regular competition can be a great way to improve. Now, competition means different things, and this is often overlooked. Competition can certainly mean joining contests, races, and other forms of contest where you are literally up against other people. But competition can also mean competing against yourself, where, for instance, you make an effort once a week or so to set a new personal best at whatever form of exercise you practice. Strategy 6 concerns adding adventure and novelty to your exercise routine. Think about how many people give up on exercising because of the sheer boredom of what they do. For instance, grinding away on exercise bicycles while counting the minutes until they can stop. Or plodding mile after mile on a treadmill that never moves and where the scenery never changes. Almost any person in America has options for improving the adventure and novelty element of their exercise and often right outside their front door. This can consist of ambitious changes such as taking up hiking, mountain climbing, or bicycling while traveling to different places, but it can also consist of simpler and low-cost strategies such as changing up your form of exercise every month or two just to learn a new activity. Compare a person who walks the same neighborhoods every day to a person who buys a local hiking trails book and, and commits to walking a different trail system every month. Which plan is more likely to be more fun, interesting, and self-sustaining? Strategy 7 is to take up a sport, and this strategy combines elements of socializing, challenge, adventure, and competition. Although many people think that sports are for young people, that is mythology that you are better off shattering as soon as possible. In the 21st century, there are people involved in almost every sport imaginable and at every age. Here in San Diego, for example, a woman recently completed the San Diego Marathon while past the age of 90. There are incredibly impressive people sprinting, bicycling, and lifting weights well into their middle and older years. Your body has the capacity to improve at any age if you commit to a regular program, and joining a sport is one of the best ways to bring out your potential for growth while simultaneously helping you to have a great time. For those of you who routinely exercise indoors, the eighth strategy of using fun distractions can be very helpful. 
Modern technology has come to our rescue here like never before, allowing us to easily bring in our own music while exercising. For instance, compare this to the not-so-distant past of just 10 or 20 years ago where you had to, at best, suffer through whatever music the gym decided to play. You can easily watch your favorite television shows on your phone or on a gym television. You can read or listen to your favorite books and podcasts or stay in touch with friends through social networking. We refer to the use of a personal trainer or joining an exercise class earlier in our third strategy of enhancing the social element of exercise. However, here is a separate strategy nine. Trainers and exercise classes have a separate benefit outside of the social dimension in that they provide instruction, motivation to improve, and accountability on a higher level than does the typical friend or workout partner. A trainer isn't just there to compliment you and take your money. They have an important job of educating you about what to do, how to do it, and to help you make progress. The research that compares the results of people exercising on their own versus under the guidance of trainers or other forms of supervised exercise shows very clearly that the latter people get better results and are more consistent. Strategy 10 refers to the benefit of having a role model. Role models are powerful. Many of us, for instance, had role models when we were young people and imagined ourselves being like them someday. Children will often run, play, and practice while seeing themselves in their head as their favorite athletes, and this is a powerful source of motivation for them. The effects of role models are so strong that we are more likely to purchase products when endorsed by people that we look up to. We may feel inspired watching hard-working contestants on the Biggest Loser show, or in other cases we may buy a certain famous athlete's line of basketball shoes just in order to feel a little more like Michael Jordan with his famous Air Jordan shoes. Now, as adults, we less often have role models like we did as children. But the world is full of people doing remarkable things, often against incredible adversity, that we can look up to as examples of real people finding a way to do perhaps exactly the same thing that we are trying to do in our own lives. Knowing that another person can overcome the odds to lose weight and transform their body can be a great source of inspiration for our own efforts. The final strategy, strategy 11, is one of the best ways to add a combination of fun, intimacy, and improved quality of life to your exercise routine and that is to have a more regular sex life. A healthy sex life is already a goal for almost everyone, so why not link that goal to your goal of also having a more regular and more fun exercise routine? Now, I do have to add with this strategy that using sex to become more physically active does come with a couple of important caveats. One of these is that the research on sexual activity shows that it does not burn as many calories as you might think. The sense of fatigue that many people feel post-orgasm, for instance, is often a hormone-induced feeling rather than a reflection of how many calories that you've burned. The second caveat is that sexual activity usually burns a lot more calories when it involves another person rather than when performed alone. However, even if you feel that your weight, health, or fitness level is a barrier to a better sex life now, file this strategy away as one to revisit as you are making progress and perhaps reconnecting with the romantic world. That is our tour of the fascinating topic of exercise psychology. Against much of the exercise research, and against the common sense of perhaps most people, exercise psychology is hugely important and greatly underappreciated. As we've explored today, improving your exercise psychology is often the single most effective way of helping you to become a regular exerciser and to reap the amazing rewards that a lifestyle including regular physical activity can bring.